Mayor Lightfoot's stalled proposal to go after gang profits fails to receive a vote. Electronic voting is underway in City Council and Supreme Court nominee Katanji Brown Jackson undergoes day three in the hot seat at her confirmation hearing. All that and more with our Spotlight Politics team. Welcome back Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon and Paris Schutz. So starting with City Council, they fired up the new electronic voting system at today's meeting, becoming the first major U.S. city to do this. Heather, how efficient is this compared to the old method? Well, the old method literally used a yellow piece of paper and a pen and relied on each alder person to yell out loud enough to be heard yay or nay. So there were certainly some glitches at City Hall today. Some alder people had trouble getting their tablet connected to the network. Some of them weren't sure what button to push, but it did work in the end. A major achievement by City Clerk Ana Valencia, who has championed the project, which in, in all will cost the city $3.5 million and move the city council from a paper-based system to a cloud-based cloud paperless system and fully enter the 21st century. Welcome. You know, I got to say, is somebody, oh, sorry, Brandis. Go ahead, just, Amanda. Yeah, is somebody who, you know, only pops in to cover city council every now and again and is used to the Illinois legislative system, which has been electronic. First of all, it is shocking to me that it took this long and that Chicago is a leader like hello. Um, but also it really can be very difficult to hear even when they shout to get a handle on what is being voted on. And so I, I think that this is one of those things where it kind of sounds like, all right, who cares, but really is uh, pivotal for transparency's sake. Also want to point out that Valencia running for statewide office at this point in time and is certainly sh going to be sure to champion this effort as part of her campaign for Secretary of State. Yeah, good point. Um, so meanwhile, uh, the mayor's stalled proposal to go after gang profits did not get a vote yet again at today's meeting. Heather, why not? Well, there just simply isn't the votes. I think I've said it before that if you think you have the votes, you call a vote. They didn't even attempt to vote today. And when she was asked about it after today's city council meeting, the mayor acknowledged she has more education to do. However, this proposal is nearly six months old. It has been revised several times in an attempt to get a majority of city council votes. And it is not clear to me what the mayor can do to convince older people People who have not been convinced by this point to jump on board. I spoke with Ed Yanka of the ACLU of Illinois, which has really helped lead the charge against this measure. He said the mayor should just drop this and move on to other initiatives he says would be more effective in stopping gun and gang violence. So officials unveiled the three finalists for Chicago's new uh, casino yesterday, uh, and it will not be built at McCormick Place because those two proposals were not selected in the top three. Um, Paris, what challenge challenges do these remaining three proposals have? They each have significant challenges, Brandis. So they're all on big parcels of land, but they're all very close to thousands of residential units. So the next steps are going to be community hearings. Who are going to be the residents showing up at these community hearings or filling their older person's phone line? The ones that don't want it in their backyard, because you have to imagine if you're OK with a casino going in your backyard, you're not going to show up to this meeting. You're just fine with it. So that's going to be a significant challenge, especially as older people are up for re-election in a year. And then you've got the one central development. Uh, that's the hard rock proposal. This is over the air rights over the train tracks by Soldier Field. This is a pie in the sky proposal at this point. I'm talking about the overall development because it is asking for nearly four billion dollars in state funding. They proposed a big transit center. And if the bears move from Soldier Field, to Arlington Heights, will the developer even want to build this massive development anymore? There's so many things up in the air with that one, but all three are going to face their challenges. It's going to be untying a Gordian knot to get some kind of uh, appearance or perception of public approval for any of these sites. It's not saying it can't be done, but it's going to be a long road. So as we heard earlier, former Illinois House Representative Edward Acevedo was just sentenced to six months in prison uh, after pleading guilty to tax evasion tied to the investigation and indictment of former House Speaker Michael Madigan. Uh, Amanda, he's not the first to plead guilty, but he is the first to be sentenced to jail time. What could this mean uh, for Madigan's case? 
Well, we don't have any indication or particularly from the court reporters who are at the federal courthouse every day and really following this, that he is cooperating with the feds to get to Madigan. But through legal filings, we are certainly aware that the feds have been talking to Acevedo about this. By the way, his son's also implicated and facing trials of their own. And so it, it, it ties in there and we are going to be watching, waiting what is revealed about the speaker. Another big development, by the way, is that Madigan's co-defendant in this latest indictment, Mike McLean, his lobbyist and longtime ally of Madigan, is facing previous charges along, of course, with some others from ComEd, Exelon, and they are going to be going to trial September 12th. And that, by the way, is just about when things are really getting underway for the next election. So that could cause issues for Democrats as some of that dirty laundry is aired during that case. Okay. Um, we're also, Amanda, you know, we're seeing some petition filing objections. Uh, how common are they, you know, this early on? So they're very common and really, so you don't need to take notice necessarily that uh, one campaign filed an objection to another candidate trying to get that candidate knocked off the ballot. But there is some question at the top of the ballot, and that is whether Jesse Sullivan, who has poured a lot of money, you, if you turn on and move away from public TV for just a little bit and turn on commercial TV, you might have seen his ads. But there is a lot of question. Does he actually have the signatures to make it on the ballot after spending all of that money? because he was a late entry to the race, had a hard time pairing up with a lieutenant governor candidate. So we're going to be watching, does the GOP primary change? By the way, also today there was a lottery and it determined that there's sort of a coveted spot in a crowded race that Darren Bailey is going to be the top individual that voters in the Republican primary will see. So, you know, on that on that note, Amanda, uh, Aurora Mayor Richard Irvin, Republican candidate for governor, as you said, has been criticizing Governor J.B. Pritzker's criminal justice package, saying that it should be uh, repealed. Is he is he out there? Is he sort of the front runner candidate or among the GOP candidates at this point? And what are some of those other candidates saying? You know, it's very difficult, I, I think, at this point to tell who is out in front. It's a strange election year. We're going to have campaigning over the summer. It's particularly odd. I mean, still pandemic. Again, timeline is moved. But certainly, Irvin is the guy with the bucks. And so that makes him somebody who is a front runner. We had the Chicago Tribune reporting, uh, sort of questioning that even though he is a campaigning, saying that he is anti Pritzker's stance on crime, that there was a letter in which he appeared to be complimentary of some facets of that major crime package. So this is sort of, I think, just gets to the difficulty that any Republican in Illinois is going to have in terms of having to appeal to a more conservative base in the primary and then have to go more moderate in a general election. And there's some a lot of positions, actually, he appears to have taken in the past that appear to be 180s now, uh, having positive comments for Black Lives Matter in the past, saying in his commercial now, all lives matter, having positive comments for the way Governor Pritzker handled COVID uh, in the beginning, now sort of staking his campaign on, on slamming that as other Republicans are going to do. So all that money is going to go toward perhaps redefining this candidate. Now, as we heard earlier, it's day three of confirmation hearings for President Joe Biden's Supreme Court nominee, Ketanji Brown Jackson. Republican senators criticizing her today, saying that she has, quote, too much empathy. Here's what she had to say. My um, attempts to communicate directly with defendants is about public safety, because most of the people who are incarcerated uh, via the federal system and even via the state system will come out, will be a part of our communities again. And so it is to our entire benefit as Congress has recognized to ensure that people who come out stop committing crimes. So Paris, what point are some GOP senators trying to make by asking questions, for example, about critical race theory um, and alleging that she's not tough enough on crime? Well, let's just level with viewers here. These hearings have become and are today uh, excuses in many cases for senators who seek higher office like the presidency to weigh in and look tough on some hot button issues. And if there's an answer from the, the judge, then it's kind of like secondary to their desire to get sound bites, to be on cable news, 
that they can then use to kind of brand themselves and fundraise. That is not to say, I'm not trying to be too cynical, it's not to say there aren't questions there from senators that do try to get to the heart of her jurisprudence. But you see today and yesterday so many senators using this time uh, for their own campaign ends, their own political ends. Um, and, and that's kind of the way it's been on both sides of the aisle for several years. Okay, that's where we'll have to leave it for Spotlight Politics. Amanda Vinicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. Thanks.